Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amrita Hari Kumar, um, and today I'm going to be talking about theories and treatments of schizophrenia. I'm currently a second year PhD student at Georgia State University, which is located in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States of America. Um, I'm currently in a schizophrenia psychosis focused neuroimaging lab, so it was really a treat to, to really research and put together these slides because it really informed me on some of the work that I'm currently doing. So I'm going to go ahead and start the slides. So I'll quickly go over some of the theories in schizophrenia, specifically the disconnectivity hypothesis. That in itself could be a two hour lecture, given that there's so many models and hypotheses and theories proposing why there's disconnectivity in schizophrenia. So I'm not going to belabor the point and spend really too much time on that. I'm instead going to focus on some papers that talk about cognitive deficits in schizophrenia, and that will be the main focus for this talk. And then finally, I will talk about holistic interventions for treatment. So this is connectivity hypothesis was talked about way earlier in the 90s by Frith and Friston. Um, they had released a paper back then talking about various sources for disconnectivity. But the real kind of essence of this idea of disconnectivity is that psychosis is a disconnection. Sometimes it's spelled with a Y, D-Y-S instead of D-I-S connection. So I just wanted to, to say that that's very common to see both, both of those spellings. Anyways, the idea is that psychosis is in essence a disconnection or disconnectivity between neuronal synapses. And I also want to say the reason also why I was saying earlier that it could be its own to our lecture is that if you read a lot of the literature out there, it's not just that there is this disconnection between neuronal synapses. There is a wide ranging amount of theories talking about why schizophrenia comes on. There's a neurodevelopmental origin or model talking about disruptions that occur in childhood or adolescence. So that could be, a, that is one of many factors um, in addition to disconnection between neuronal synapses. We also see disruptions between GABA and glutamate. We see disruptions between dopamine and serotonin. We see disruptions um, at the genetic level with genome-wide association studies going in depth about this. Um, and then we also see vulnerability and stress playing a huge part as, as to you know, how trauma could potentially be one of the factors for triggering a psychotic episode. Um, and so we see a lot of different models and theories and hypotheses out there that could potentially explain some of this disconnectivity that we see in individuals with schizophrenia. And also there, there are a lot of studies out there examining cannabis use and, and drug, uh, but, you know, drug induced or drug oriented factors that could, uh, could be the reason for some of the psychotic symptoms. So all I want to say is that this disconnectivity hypothesis is very nuanced. There are many reasons as to why there's disconnection. Um, in individuals with schizophrenia, there's, there's really different ways to kind of go about what disconnectivity means. But I just wanted to very quickly mention that, um, you know, this is one way that it has been defined and if you look out in the literature, there are many different models and hypotheses that explain this disconnection. Also wanted to orient your attention to the fact that we really also see in the neuroimaging literature trends of both increased functional connectivity and decreased functional connectivity. And so functional connectivity is the, the connections between two functional brain regions, two or more. Um, so, so that that's important to note because we see both these trends 
across various brain regions and that that also highlights these trends of disconnectivity that we see these kind of mixed patterns of both increase and decrease connectivity um so i just wanted to mention that kind of switching attention now from the disconnectivity hypothesis and debate um, is really focusing now on cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. And so when we think of cognitive deficits, we can define it in a many variety of ways. One thing to keep in mind is that, you know, cognitive deficits could be functions such as thinking and planning that are affected in individuals with schizophrenia. And so one of the regions, brain regions that are affected is the prefrontal cortex. And in the literature, it's abbreviated as PFC because there are so many brain regions that are talked about in the literature that it's, it's just much easier to abbreviate it. So we see here that the PFC, which is responsible for thinking and planning, is very much affected in individuals with schizophrenia. And specifically, they have difficulties with something called working memory. They have difficulties with some, you know, storing information, retrieving information, sustaining attention, keeping the attention, um, inhibiting responses and, or, or holding themselves back from saying or doing certain things, having cognitive flexibility, which means just switching your mind from one task to another. So all of these things broadly encompass kind of some of the cognitive deficits we see in terms of something called executive functioning. And really that's difficulties with thinking and planning. And this is also from the Atkin 2022. I should go back and just highlight, yeah. So this was uh, the Atkin et al. 2022 paper that I got this from and what I will be talking about for the majority of this talk. So from the Atkin paper, there was this graphic which I thought beautifully illustrated some of the cognitive control and executive functioning kind of networks. And we see here that it's broken down into A, B, and C. And that in graphic A, we see that areas of cognitive control networks are, um, are sort of disrupted in terms of executive function, because as we see that the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex or the DACC uh, functioning is increased, we see decreased functioning in the medial prefrontal cortex. And so these brain networks are responsible for um, executive functioning planning. And so um, I think that's important to note. And then in terms of explicit emotional regulation, which is what the second or, or um, figure B is stating, we see a decrease in the function of the amygdala, but an increase in the functioning of the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And, and that shows the functioning of explicit emotion regulation with regards to to the default mode network. And the default mode network is a brain region that, or, or a set of brain regions that are active when you're not doing anything, when your mind is at rest. These default, by default, the default mode network regions are always active. That's why it's called the default mode network. By default, always on. So that's what you see in, in figure B. And then in figure C, you see here in the implicit emotion regulation um, that there's decreased functioning of the amygdala, but then increased functioning of the ventral um, anterior cingulate cortex. So that's just important to consider broadly because you see kind of changes in the cognitive control network, changes in the default mode network, and changes in implicit emotion regulation specific networks that are all kind of governed by these trends. And when you see disconnectivity in any of these, specifically in cognitive control networks, you see that there's this push and pull between connectivity between certain brain regions that are affected and then affect your ability to think, your ability to reason, your ability to sustain attention. And so that was kind of the main reason I wanted to bring up this, this um, flow chart. So continuing on from this paper, uh, one reason I wanted to also highlight the studies is very nicely laid out the neuropsychological findings and the neuroimaging findings. 
Um, and overall, kind of some of the notable findings of this paper is that there's decreased prefrontal cortex functioning. And what was fascinating was they saw that there was a 0.8 to almost 1.5 standard deviation below functioning compared to control subjects. And so I thought this was very fascinating and something that should be noted. What Etkin specifically noted was that there was impaired verbal memory and verbal fluency abilities in individuals with schizophrenia compared to healthy controls. And so once again, this goes back to what I was saying with executive functioning and working memory being affected, it also affects other cognitive def other cognitive domains and, and you see deficits in other regions. So here Etkin noted that there was impaired verbal memory and impaired verbal fluency abilities. We also see, as I had mentioned very early on with the disconnectivity hypothesis, that there is a neurodevelopmental trajectory of deficits. And this is seen in both patients and first degree relatives. We see broadly that there is a genetic risk also with schizophrenia. And there are studies coming out that have noted this genetic risk and genetic kind of um, overlap in both patients and first degree relatives. That's something I'm personally interested in. And so for me, it was fascinating to read that this, this neurodevelopmental trajectory was, was seen in both groups. Transitioning now to the neuroimaging findings, we see that there are deficits in cognitive functioning and abilities. Specifically, Etkin noted that there was a failure to activate the prefrontal cortex correctly. And so this is so important to, to note because we talked a little bit earlier about, like I said, the push and pull of brain networks that are um, you know, implicated when we talk about disconnectivity and talk about executive functioning and cognitive deficits and schizophrenia. But what is specifically important to note is this failure to activate the prefrontal cortex correctly. And that can lead to a whole host of working memory and cognitive deficit um, issues in schizophrenia. And what Edkin was specifically saying was several things. There's a failure to activate cognitive networks. There's a failure to deactivate the default mode networks. If you don't deactivate it, it is active at the most kind of inopportune or inappropriate times. And that could lead to other potential attentional deficits, other cognitive deficits. And so they go on to say that there's abnormalities in the interaction between prefrontal cognitive networks and the DMN. So the other important thing to note is not only was there a failure to activate cognitive networks, but there were abnormalities in interaction between networks. And so that really is what disconnectivity is. Disconnectivity, in essence, is also that abnormality in interaction between networks the disconnection between those networks. So I wanna say that even though I'm not explicitly saying the disconnectivity hypothesis here in this paper, it, it's always important to keep in mind in, in any schizophrenia study that disconnectivity is the undercurrent, the running theme. Um, and in this case, even though we're talking about executive functioning and working memory and the prefrontal cortex, it is, in essence, this connectivity of the prefrontal cortex and the default mode network. If I wanted to put the study in a nutshell, it would be that. And what's also interesting is that we see this disconnectivity or, or this failure to regulate in first-degree relatives of patients with schizophrenia. And so, like I said, it's I think it's so important to study, you know, relatives uh, because I think there's a treasure trove of data to be had that we haven't really explored yet. And we don't know what we'll find um, in terms of genetic and uh, neuroimaging data, but I think it's, it's interesting that they were also affected. Finally, we see deficits also in activities with N-methyl ID aspartate or the NMDA receptor, which is not surprising to me because um, after reading many papers pertaining to disconnectivity, this is one of the receptors that um, is also affected. And so Etkin talks about the fact that blocking the NMDA receptor with ketamine yielded similar results and decreased network activation. I wanted to kind of shift attention to another paper. This is a little bit older, but I thought 
it would be nice to kind of give a quick overview of other cognitive deficits seen in schizophrenia. So, and with regards to IQ, we see decreased IQ scores both before and after diagnosis and declines even happening even after diagnosis. We also see poor ability regarding maintaining an attention span both before and after first episode psychosis. And these are some much older papers, but still I think important to mention. And then finally, since we're still on the topic of cognitive deficits, we also see um, previous studies kind of mentioning difficulties producing words from phonological and semantic memory um, with regards to individuals with schizophrenia. So overall, it's not just working memory deficits or, or deficits in um, the prefrontal cortex. We, we broadly see deficits in IQ, we see deficits in attention, we see deficits in verbal fluency as well. And finally, in terms of holistic treatments for schizophrenia, there are several things that have been discussed and I, I wanted to draw your attention to this paper by Gangoli, which was published in 2018. And so they had this really nice table, which I um, decided to put on these slides. And so this study kind of looked at, um, you know, different symptoms and problems individuals with schizophrenia face and how these can be managed using both pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods. And so on the left-hand side, you have symptoms related to schizophrenia. On the right-hand side, under treatment and support options are some options that were listed, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological options. And so some of the symptoms we see, of course, are hallucinations and delusions, which affect uh, individuals' ability to live independently. We also see withdrawal from social life, disorganized behavior, lack of employment, lack of support, lack of education, and lack of recreation and entertainment. In terms of treatment options, there are a plethora of things that have been discussed here. So some options include antipsychotic drugs, um, but then complementary interventions such as vitamin D or folic acid. Um, yoga has been mentioned as a complementary um, non-pharmacological method. We also see cognitive behavior therapy as an option um, in, in conjunction with antipsychotic drugs, yoga therapy, folic acid supplements. Um, and really that's the theme I see throughout CBT and yoga um, as, as some of the next in line supports um, in conjunction with antipsychotics as complementary interventions. And that theme kind of continues um, here in terms of suicide prevention, in terms of um, you know, lack of exercise, a lack of overall well-being or even substance abuse. Um, they were saying that CBT and yoga um, may greatly decrease some of these feelings um, in terms of lack of support um, and some of the behavioral symptoms. So it's something to consider. And thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, please contact this email here. Um, and thank you so much.